These lessons will provide you with the skills to take a term and change it into whatever your heart desires using the magic of function manipulation. Functions exist and are applied to every walk of life. Hi, how you doing? Pretty good, how are you? I know they bought these CDs at the wholesale price for $3, and now they're trying to sell them to me for 5 How much is it? How many CDs do you think you'll need to sell to have a profit of $250? To determine the profit, we'll need to develop equations or functions. Now students, how would you write the wholesale price of the CDs knowing that they cost $3 each? You would write $3 times the number of CDs. Or you can use 3x. Since we don't know the number of CDs, let the variable x represent the number of CDs. Therefore, the term 3x represents the wholesale price of any number of CDs. Knowing that a variable is a letter used to stand for a quantity that changes in value, and a term is a number, variable, or the product or quotient of a number and a variable. Now, how would you write the selling price of any number of CDs knowing that they sold for $5 each? You would write $5 times the number of CDs. Or 5x. Again, since we don't know the number of CDs, we'll use the variable x to represent them. So the selling price is symbolized by 5x. Now, what would your wholesale price be for 100 CDs? It would be $3 times 100, and that would equal $300. And what is the selling price of 100 CDs? That would be $5 times 100, which will equal $500. In the terms of 3x and 5x, the x is representing what real value relative to the buying and selling of the CDs? x equals the number of CDs. Now, since we're counting objects, that type of information is called discrete data. Discrete data involves a count of data items, such as number of people or objects. Whereas continuous data that we aren't involved in in this experiment involves measurements. Continuous data is having measurements that change between data points, such as temperature, length, and weight. From the previous information listed, what would you say the profit would be from the sale of 100 CDs? The profit would equal $500 minus $300, and that would equal $200. Now, using the idea of guess and check, how many CDs would you have to sell to have a profit of $250? Let's see if the profit would equal Five times two hundred minus three times two hundred. That would equal one thousand dollars minus six hundred dollars, and that would equal four hundred dollars. Well, that's a little bit too much. So let's see. Let's try one fifty. Okay, one fifty. Let's see if the profit is equal to five times. 150 minus 3 times 150, that would equal to $750 minus $450, and that would equal $300. That's, That's still too much. Yeah. Let's try uh, 125 maybe. Okay. Let's see. 5 times 125 minus 3 times 125, and that would equal $625 minus $375 and that would equal $250. Since you all had information to guess around, 
It didn't take you long to come up with the answer. To get the answer from a minimum amount of information that will give you not only the answer you are seeking, but will give you the amount of profit for any number of CDs sold, and a general rule should be developed. Let's do that from our previous work. What would the profit equation look like if we replaced the number of CDs sold with the variable used to represent them? That equation would look like profit equals 5x minus 3x. The x variable also represents the domain, since it represents the set of all possible values that can be put into the equation. You've got what's called a variable expression now. A variable expression is a mathematical phrase that uses numbers, variables, and operation symbols. To simplify the variable expression, let's use algebra tiles. The blue rectangular tiles represent positive x values, and the yellow pieces represent negative x values. Make a picture of what you think positive 5x would look like. Next to the 5x pieces show how you would represent negative 3x with the algebra tiles. Now, take out the pieces that are exact opposites of each other, such as, what is the opposite of positive 1? Negative 1. So what are you going to take out of the picture altogether? 3 negative and 3 positive tiles. Terms that are exact opposites of each other are called zero pairs. Since you've, since you've taken out now all of your zero pairs, what result does your picture represent? Positive 2x. Now, let's rewrite the profit equation with the variable expression simplified. Profit equals 5x minus 3x. What will the profit equation be if you substitute in the amount of profit we originally projected? It would be profit is equal to 2x and $250 would equal 2x. The resulting equation can be solved using several different methods. First, We'll let Joy use the algebraic method to solve this. Okay, you have $250 divided by 2, which equals 2x divided by 2. And you would do 250 divided by 2, that is equal to $125, and that will equal x, since your 2's cancel out. Now let's use another method to get the, to the solution to this problem. Let's use algebra tiles this time. Since each unit square will equal 25, make a picture, please, for 250 is equal to 2x. Since one unit square equals 25, I use 10 to represent 250. Since one rectangular tile equals 1x, I'll use 2 to come to the 2x. And to come to the solution, I'll divide them equally to get 1x equals 125. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is even another way to arrive at the solution for how many CDs it will take to sell to arrive at a profit of $250. For those of you who have your graphing calculators, take out your trusty TI-82 or 83s and let's work with them. In the Y1, you want to list the amount of profit you anticipate, $250. The other side of the equation was the selling price minus the cost, which resulted in 2x. Two and the x key is the one, two, th third row down, second column. Hit graph. 
we should end up with a graph of the 2x equation. The y equals 250 is not showing up. Consequently, we'll have to inspect, go back to our equations, inspect our equations, and decide on how our windows should be changed in order for both of our equations to show up. We need an appropriate window at this time. So you want to think about what's in the y equals that is not in your window. The graph that we came up with looks like a 10-10 window. Do you think a graph at y equals 250 would show up in a 10-10 window? I don't think so. Therefore, if we go back to our window, and since we have an equation of y equals 250, that means that our y max needs to increase. If you'll arrow down to your y max, increase it to 300, which will indeed include 250. Go back up to the y min, make that a uh, negative 100 should do. Change your y scale to 10 graphs. See what your picture looks like. There it is, y equals 250. But look at the y equals 2x line. It's not appropriate. We'll still have to go back and change our window further. So let's go back and change our x max and our x mins so that our x values, our, our graph of y equals 2x will look better. Now we'll need to change the window even further. The reason for that is because it's very important for you to see a pictorial view of your solution. The solution of those two equations is the point where those two lines cross. So let's go back to the graphing calculator and adjust our window even further. In the window now, we will need to change, or we'll try changing, our x max and our x min to accommodate the point of intersection that will appear out here in this area. So back in the window, we'll change our x min to 100, change our x max. Since we know our solution is at 125, we'll change our x max to 200. For the calculator to properly accommodate those numbers, our x scale will have to be at 10 or higher. Now graph and check out your picture. Your point of solution appears in the upper right, or should appear in the upper right hand corner. To have your graphing calculator generate the solution to the two equations you have in your y equals, we'll use the graph graphing calculator's intersect feature which is found at second, in the second calculate menu. So let's go to your graphing calculator. And if you'll notice on the first row, above the trace button is calculate. That's the feature we're going to use to find the intersect menu. So second, calculate, and number five is intersect. If your students will hit five, that sets your calculator up in the intersect mode. And you'll notice the graphing calculator will ask you questions. It says, is my cursor on the first curve? If it is, you'll hit enter for yes. The cursor will then change to the other line. Now the graphing calculator is saying, is my cursor on your second curve? If it is, hit enter for yes. Now the calculator says, give me a guess of where you think the point of intersection is. To get the calculator to give you the appropriate answer, move your cursor up to a point as close as you can possibly get to the projected point of intersection and hit enter. And the calculator will give you the point of intersection coordinates x equaling, in this case, 125, and y equaling 250. Now to have our graphing calculator solve our equation, our profit equation, 
in terms of a function, we'll need to take our profit equation and turn it into the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line. Our profit equation having been 250 equals 2x and the equation of a line form being y is equal to mx plus b will cause the 250 to be shifted to the other side of the equal sign resulting in the equation of y is equal to 2x minus 250. Now the reason we want to investigate this portion is because we want to know generically for any number of CDs how much profit over 250 or under 250 will be generated. Therefore, in your y equals we want to go back and take out the information we put in earlier. Clear your y1, clear your y2, and enter your function now. A function is a relation that assigns exactly one value of the dependent variable to each value of the independent variable, where the y is the, represented as the dependent variable and x is the independent variable. Now, we'll enter the function in the graphing calculator. 2x minus, do not use a negative key, 250, and enter. Let's graph. Considering the picture, our function generated in the graphing calculator, to be able to see more of the graph of that function, we'll need to go and readjust our window. In the graphing calculator, I think it might be advisable if we increase our x max even more and increase the y min to be able to see even more of the function on the screen. So let's go do that. Window. First, let's look back at the graph and talk about our decision. We want to see more of the graph in the upper part, right hand part of the graphing calculator. We want to see more of the graph in the lower part. This is called the first quadrant, the second quadrant, the third quadrant, the fourth quadrant of a coordinate plane. Our graph is clearly mostly in the first and fourth quadrants. That's, those are the areas we want to increase. So let's go into our y equals, add more to our x max. Let's make, increase the x max to about 300. Go down to the y min, increase it to about 200, and graph. And now you can see an adequate picture of the function y is equal to 2x minus 250. Our graph is called a linear function, a function whose graph forms a straight line. Its rule is an equation that has 1 as the, its greatest power. Now we want to visit the domain and range values via the trace feature of the graphing calculator. So let's look at how our graphing calculator with our trace feature can give us the domain of the function that we've entered as our profit function, y is equal to 2x minus 250. In your graphing calculator, got y is equal to 2x minus 250 in. If you'll graph that, we'll end up with a picture such as that. To trace to where the break-even point is represented, we want y to equal 0. Using the left key, you'll notice at the bottom the y value with the window we presently have will never be 0. Consequently, we'll have to go into the window and change the window again. To get good values, to get friendly values in the graphing calculator, 
it's advisable to start from what's called the friendly window. The friendly window is found through the Zoom 4 operation. We can't see any of our graph in that window. We'll have to go back into our window, remaining in the friendly window, and simply multiply our numbers by numbers we think will increase or decrease the friendly numbers, respectively, to be able to show the graph that we want to see and at the same time graph to the particular values in the trace feature we want to have. So let's try with multiplying our x min by 50. Just enter times 50 and hit enter and you'll see it automatically changes your number. Arrow over to the x max, multiply that by 50. Hit enter. Since we have lar much larger values now, you need to change your scale. Let's change it to 10. We know from previous graphs that multiplying our y min and my y max by 100 should get us a decent picture on the screen. So let's multiply this times 100. Enter. Multiply the y max times 100. Change your y scale to 10 and simply hit graph. We've got a decent picture again. Your trace feature should trace now to the break-even point where y is equal to 0. We know that the point of where y is equal to 0 is the break-even point because that's where we have 125 CDs giving us a profit of $250. To investigate the complete domain or a simulated large domain of the function we have entered into the graphing calculator, if you'll go second table, you'll see a table appear with all of the values that are included or that can be with some of the values not all of the values because we know that between every integer there are an infinite number of numbers but here we have a decent representation of the domain and range since we're dealing with integer numbers only with discrete data only for the function we have in the graphing calculator. Together the x and y values form what is known as ordered pairs. Any set of these ordered pairs or any ordered pairs together are called a relation. A relation is just simply any set of ordered pairs. Each ordered pair represents the number of items sold and the number of the amount of increase. Each ordered pair represents the number of items sold and the amount of increase in profit. To write the function rule in function notation, from our graphing calculator, we've got y is equal to 2x minus 250. Here we have the equation y is equal to 2x minus 250 listed as our function. Function notation is just simply replacing the y with f of x is equal to 2x minus 250 being our resulting function. Our function, if we'll go back to the graph, gave us a line with a diagonal slant upward to the right noticing and noting that that slope of that line is called positive slope since it slants up to the right. Now that we've investigated our function in several different ways and our profit equation with several different techniques, let's take a look back at the graph again and indeed discuss a way to verify whether or not a graph is indeed a function. In your graphing calculator, you have your diagonal line. If you can pass a vertical line through the diagonal line of your graphing calculator at any point, 
such as using this tile to slice through your graph at any point where it only touches your graph of the line that or the equation that you've created once, then you know you have graphed a function. Our graph is from the function rule called y is equal to 2x minus 250. A function rule is simply an equation that describes a function. One final way we'll use today to investigate our information and to generate a function is to go back to our table in our graphing calculator and take a look at the ordered pairs we have. Pick two of those and find the slope. Then use the point slope form of the equation of a line to generate our function. Let's do it. In the graphing calculator, you have your table. From your table, pick any two arbitrary points. I'm going to use 125, 0, and 130, 10. We know that the slope equation is defined as the change in y over the change in x equaling y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. With our first ordered pair representing x1 and y1, our second ordered pair representing x2 and y2. Simply take the numbers substitute them into the formula for the slope, giving us 10 minus 0 over 130 minus 125, which equals 10 over 5, giving us the proverbial 2 that was the coefficient on our x in our original function that we entered into the graphing calculator to generate the table you see. We know that y minus y sub 1 is equal to m, which is the same as delta y over delta x, another, simply another way of representing the slope, times x minus x1. We'll take our information and make another substitution, bringing us to y is equal to y1 equaling 0 in our fir from our first ordered pair. So that's y minus 0 equals 2 for our change in y over change in x slope times x minus our x1 from our first ordered pair is 125. resulting in the equation of y is equal to 2x minus 250, matching the original equation we entered into the graphing calculator. We started this program by viewing the real-life situations where functions are generated. Now, let's review all of the terms we've seen in this program. We've talked about a variable, a letter representing any, any number. We've talked about a term. We've talked about discrete data, counting data. We've talked about continuous data, measurement data. We've talked about range and domain, the x and y values in a function. We've talked about a relation, a relation being an ordered pair, a group or a set, rather, of ordered pairs. We looked at the use of the vertical line test to be able to prove whether or not a graph is indeed a function. We've used the variable expressions. We've created functions and generated a function rule. Now, your teacher will have supplemental materials to help you to further understand the concepts we've dealt with today. Take a look at the information that accompanies this program and hopefully the guides we